Well, I'm Patty Rapper. I'm here with Kyle. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so you've been traveling or no? Yes, okay. traveling quite a bit, actually. Okay, so you've been seeing what types of new people, new places, that sort of thing? Um, mostly traveling uh, for recruiting designers onto our site. Mm -hmm. So we have over 300 designers across the U.S. right now as part of our platform. So I was just in New York, for example, for the International Contemporary Furniture Fair, <laughs> which is a really cool design show where literally designers from all over the world come to New York to see the latest and greatest in and furniture and textiles and wall coverings, lighting design. Um, so it's a really fun opportunity to meet new designers and to connect with our designers in New York. Um, so we actually hosted a little cocktail party for our designers there and got to talk shop, which was really fun. I did see some of that on your social site. <laughs> yeah. For you. So you're posting. Oh, yes. Lots of social media. <laughs> How is that working for you? It's going really well, actually. You know what? We did an event recently with Kitchen Surfing, which is this amazing um, on-demand private chef service company and One Fine Stay, um, which is short-term rentals, but they kind of curate their property. So a little bit higher end than like an Airbnb experience. Okay. Um, so we did a series of lunches and dinners at a One Fine Stay property with kitchen surfing chefs. And then Laurel and Wolf did all the styling. So we created different tablescapes and we basically designed the whole like outdoor patio area. And, um, and so it was really fun. We invited a lot of bloggers and tastemakers. And, you know, literally after one event, our Instagram following doubled. Great. You know, so it was a great way, you know, really Instagram-worthy photos. And, awesome. <laughs> yeah, and so now, that was great. What kind of, when you started to get out there and do more of the social media stuff, what were some of the things that you felt were just kind of like the, the bigger challenges and trying to make it all make sense? Well, we're just trying to figure out what platforms are best for converting, you know, taking people interested in following our photos and, and bringing them to the site and kind of telling them about what we do. Mm -hmm. And then I think that we've found, so it was kind of figuring out, okay, well, Facebook is good for that. You know, Twitter is really hard to figure out who to engage with. And so you're just kind of feeling like you're out there and you're following people and you're trying to tweet at them, but you're not really sure. Um, you know, whereas I think something like Instagram and Pinterest have been great for us more for brand recognition. You don't, it's hard to kind of click through to the site from like Pinterest followers, but at the same token, you know, people seeing us and what we're all about and they see our, they associate our name with kind of beautiful design and interesting things, I think is good for our brand. Um, not necessarily like a customer acquisition tool, but I think it's good for us kind of building our name. If so, that makes sense. <laughs> let's explore a little bit about Laurel and Wolf. It's, yeah. it's affordable, mm -hmm. it's attainable, mm -hmm. and you're recruiting designers mm -hmm. for it. How does that whole model work? So I like to say that we're democratizing interior design. Okay. So our system is we basically wanted to create an interior design marketplace where we streamline the process for a client and for designers. Mm -hmm. So customers come to the site, they take an interior design style quiz, which is really simple. It's 12 images. You love it or you leave it. And at the end of the 12 images, we can tell you what your style is. So great, you're modern or you're shabby chic or whatever it is. And then all you do is answer a series of very simple questions about your space that you want designed. Mm -hmm. So we can do a single room or we can do multiple rooms at one time. And it's all the questions that a regular, an in-person interior designer would ask you. So, you know, who uses the space? Do you have kids? Do you have pets? Um, what do you use it for? Colors? Are you interested in repainting? Things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And then you upload photos of the room. Uh, we have a great partnership with this amazing room measuring app called Magic Plan. And it's incredible. You literally stand in the middle of the room, you shoot at your corners, and it creates a fully dimensioned floor plan for you in under a minute. Oh my goodness. And shows you windows, shows you doors, your access points. I mean, it's an incredible tool. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so then you're able to upload that to the platform. And then for a flat fee, um, you get multiple designers designing for your space. And what's cool about it is that the customer sets their budget on what they want to spend on the product. And they can also include items that they already own, like you have a sofa you love or some art accessories. So let's say you know you want to only spend a couple thousand dollars redoing your living room. You have quite a bit of the furniture, but you need help kind of pulling it all together. 
So you would include all of that, and then designers keep that in mind when they design your space. So that way, when you get a design from a designer, you know that it's exactly in your budget. That's fascinating. And so yeah. how, how's the response been? It's been amazing. It's been so... People are so excited that they can finally access professional interior design help. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, HGTV is huge right now. It's the third largest network in the country for primetime and weekend viewing. Yeah. You have all these people who are really excited about design and passionate about making their home a more beautiful space and their business is more beautiful. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the DIY approach evolved out of necessity. Mm-hmm. You know, most people can't afford to hire a traditional interior designer. Sure. So the fact that they're like, wow, for you know our classic package is for two hundred and ninety nine dollars mm-hmm. for a single room. You can get five designers submitting designs for your space, and you know that you can afford all the items. You get your furniture placement, instructions from the designer, a full shopping list. So it's just been really exciting. People are just over the moon that they can actually have access to this now. So. And you are you are showcasing it on TV and different channels and different venues and so on. How is that working? It's good. I mean, we just started some outreach early on now, and um, and that is going to amp up as we prepare sure. for um, launching the next the new version of our product. So, Great. yeah, so the journey to million dollar decorators. How how has that been? Uh, well, Million Dollar Decorators was a show that I was on uh, when I worked for a design firm called Martin Lawrence Ballard mm-hmm. Design. Mm-hmm. Um, it was an interesting experience. Yeah. I was a senior designer there for a number of years. Um, we focused only on very high-end residential and commercial design. And the show was, it was fun, you know. So you got a good taste of what it, what it means to definitely put your product out there yes. in a big platform sort of way. Yes, absolutely. Has that helped you? Has it helped you kind of through your journey now to really just kind of see, okay, that's what that looks like. And so with now launching your brand and the different things that you need to kind of keep in mind as you're going down this path. Absolutely. I think that, you know, for me, the best thing that I learned from being on Million Dollar Decorators and then I was on uh, HGTV as well was, was kind of finding the right opportunity to meet the right thing that you're trying to sell or the right brand. So making sure that through especially some of these traditional medias, that whether it's a shelter magazine or television, that the audience that you're reaching is the right audience for the product you're offering. Right. So, you know, for example, I think HGTV would be the perfect fit for something like Laurel and Wolf. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, you know, I think that if we're if we were trying to sell something that was very, very high end, it maybe wouldn't be the right audience for us. You know, uh, sure. maybe we would be looking at trying to get an exclusive in architecture digest or something Mm -hmm. along those lines so I think you know figuring out you know really who your key demographic is and and which of those you know medias are the best way of directly accessing them I think is is what I really learned it's been incredibly valuable so the industry is definitely giving you some insight on ways to really position your product your brand Mm -hmm. how have you transitioned over to the techie side? How has that been? <laughs> it's been interesting. Okay. Um, you know, I have zero tech background, um, so it is definitely a whole new world. Mm-hmm. I have done lots of Googling, yeah. <laughs> lots of reading. Um, there's great books and guides out there. Sometimes it's just pure and tea overwhelming. I mean, I think that for me, I really enjoy the product side of it on the front end, so the design part of the site, I've been very hands-on because I'm a designer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an interior designer, but I still obviously have very I, strong yeah. um, preferences for how the site looks aesthetically. Um, and, and I always joke that even, you know, it's it's good that we kind of have a balance. We have engineers who, who you know, understand the best way that sites should work and function and how we can create elegant solutions to things. But I think that it's also nice balance because we'll be going through a new version of the product and I'll get to a page and I say to my engineers, I just say, I have no idea what to do. (laughs) Where do I, where do I click? Like, how do I make this feature work? Or I'm trying to click on this icon, but it doesn't do anything. And so I think it, it kind of helps actually balance out the product that we're building because you're getting, we have, you know, the engineering perspective and then I'm kind of your 
average user, you know. I am definitely the first person to abandon a site if I don't know how to use the, if I don't know what they're trying to get me to do. Right. So I think that's been kind of helpful, actually. So you've um, really been able to get in there and just really help coach the, the tech team yep. as, as a user would expect. Their exactly. Level. And, you know, we're, we're building, you know, some of our consumers are, are savvier, but, you know, most, most Americans are still not as technologically savvy as, you know, on their desktop or on mobile as, you know, for example, people of our generation in San Francisco who are around new tech products every day. Right. So I think we kind of have to keep that in mind, A. And I know that, you know, we're marketplace, so we have the, the customer side and we also have our whole design community. Mm-hmm. And designers are, are more tech savvy than they were before, mm-hmm. um, but they're still not, you know... They're, they're still kind of a, a bit behind. They're kind of in the same box as a lot of our customers. So we need to make it very easy for them to use the platform, you know, to manage their projects, to manage their portfolios, right. just really simple. I always say, you know what, I'll be happy as long as the site's pretty, it's clean, it's simple, and everyone knows how to use it. <laughs> like, yeah, absolutely. You know. So, Laura, what, what challenges have you experienced in this journey? I mean, I'm sure the techie side of it has been yeah. a learning curve. Yeah. But what about, like, actually, how do I fund this? How do I make this all come together? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I think that it's it's every yeah. I mean, I have zero. I had zero background in in business per se in terms of uh, the tech business. So the prospect of going out and raising um, financing was very scary. And mm-hmm. um, just like hiring engineers, like mm-hmm. how am I going to vet an engineer? And I was lucky enough to kind of talk to a lot of CTOs and rely on friends to help me vet certain people. Mm -hmm. But it's very frustrating because I felt like the engineering side of things in particular I find to be the hardest because it's the thing that I I least can help and the the thing that I have the least control over. Um, Whereas the fundraising, it was like, okay, you know what? I mean, I know my business. I've modeled it out. I know where we can make money. I know what kind of market we're trying to target. I know how we are going to increase the interior design market. Mm -hmm. So it's about just really knowing your business inside out and backwards and being able to properly articulate that vision to, to investors. Okay. So that was, that was a little bit easier, um, than the tech side of things for sure. And I think that just any founder kind of experiences in an early stage company is that you're just trying to move every single ball forward all at the same time. So it's, okay, we're building the product. We're building, especially because we have, we're a marketplace business. So we need to get not just designers or not just customers. We have to grow both at the same time. Right. So it's, you know, customer acquisition, it's designer acquisition, it's creating content to our marketing strategy. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, the fundraising process, which thankfully we're, we just finished a fundraise. So we have a little bit of breathing room now, but, um, you know, pushing the product forward. And so you, you have all of these different things that you're trying to move forward and quickly all at once. So not a lot of sleep. Not a lot of sleep. How is that factoring into your personal life? Do you get a chance to really have me time? I try to. I really do. I think that um, exercise, for example, is really important to me. And I think that taking the time, I've had to adjust my schedule and wake up even earlier to get it in. But that hour that I go and and focus on exercise is really great for me. I come out energized, refreshed. I have new ideas. Um, I think it's too easy to just say, okay, I need to, I need to only focus on the business. Um, you have to take like an hour here and there where you can get it. And I think it makes you better and it'll make you, you know, stronger and you, you're, it gives you a moment to clear your head. Um, but you know, the balance has not been good otherwise. You know, I, it's, I joked with my friends and I say, I just don't remember what it's like to be a normal person anymore. <laughs> I don't remember what it was like before I started this business, but trying very much so to, to spend time with my good friends. And I'm, I'm very lucky. I have a wonderful husband. He's been very supportive. Right. Um, and he's an entrepreneur as well. He owns his own business. So he certainly understands the long hours and the challenges of, of building a new company. And, mm-hmm. um, I think that's been very helpful. Great. Yeah. Great. And so what would you, what would you advise, uh, women trying to step into this development space? as far as, you know, keeping, keeping with it, staying, staying the course. I think women make great founders. I mean, I think that we should have more women in technology in general. 
whether it's engineers or marketers or, or female CEOs. I think, for example, in LA, we have a really great community, actually, of mm-hmm. incredible female founders. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I would say to them that we need to support one another, first and foremost. I think that women getting together and supporting each other in, in being female um, females in technology, I think, is really important. Uh, and I think that getting out of our own way, mm-hmm. I think that... I had heard a lot of rumors about tech and they're sexist and this and that and the other. And I have been beyond pleasantly surprised at how open-minded and just wonderful everyone in technology has been about me being a first-time female founder coming from outside of the tech space. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I think a lot of my concerns were were kind of my own stereotypes that I put in my head okay. that I had kind of created. Well, I wonder if they'll think this, or I wonder if this is how this is going to play out, or I, or I wonder if they'll perceive me in this way. Okay. And I think that it, if we can get rid of those, those kinds of ideas and just be like, hey, we're all people, you know, I'm... People ask me what it's like to be a female founder, and I say I don't I don't know what it's like to be a female founder. I'm just a just a founder, you yeah. know. Yeah. And I'm a girly girl, and I very much enjoy being female. It's an important part of who I am, mm-hmm. but it doesn't necessarily make a difference in my business necessarily. I think it's just about going out and and building something and being a part of something that you're really passionate about. Sure. And and but I do think that is really important that that women really stick together and, and support one another in these endeavors. Absolutely. Um, so absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. So what would you say to a young girl wanting to you know has a great idea, um, no idea where to start, someone that's actually in the trenches? Mm-hmm. What would you say to that girl? I would say, first of all, if you really have a great idea and you believe in it, then go for it. I think that, you know, women make great founders. We're great at multitasking. We are collaborative by nature. It is definitely all of the kind of personality traits that make wonderful leaders. And I would say that to to reach out to people in their community or even random, you know, I know that if I got an email from a girl, you know, saying, hey, I have an idea, I'm a teenager or I'm in college or whatever it was, I'd love your advice just as a female founder. I know I would absolutely reach out, respond and, and talk to that girl. I think the best thing we can do is share our experiences and talk about what it's like to build and and what the journey's been like and and concerns and successes and things like that. And I know that that even just a cold reach out to someone you admire, you never know who's going to respond. Right. So never be, never, you know, you're only going to get, anyone's ever going to tell you no if you ask the question. So I would say to young girls, like, just go out and ask the questions. Mm -hmm. Meet the right people. Approach anyone who you think could be good for what you're looking to build. And you will most likely get a lot of yeses along the way. Great advice. Great advice. I'm Patty Rappa. I'm Laura Spielman. We're at Girl Tech News here at Cross Campus talking shop about girls and tech.